on today's story beat. Write every day, write something, write on a, on anything, but write. You don't have to sit there for four hours. You don't have to carve out lots of time for yourself, but write, just keep like you would taking a walk, like you would whatever your routine is every day. If you really have something to say, say it. Don't say, oh, I, I talked to so many people who almost got that screenplay done or almost, wrote it down but were afraid for some reason they heard too many other voices i don't compare yourself with no one but yourself write about what you care about and someone else i really believe will care about it this is story beat with steve cuton a podcast for the creative mind story beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Karen Lee Hopkins, became a writer, director, and producer because she repeatedly got cut out of films like The Breakfast Club and Three Amigos. And she didn't want to go back to Sandusky, Ohio and work on a factory line like her mother. With 21 bucks to her name, out of desperation, she wrote a screenplay in 12 days and sold it overnight, which launched her writing career. Karen's writing credits include Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael, Stepmom, Because I Said So, and Miss Meadows, which she also directed. Karen also wrote and directed A Woman's a Hell of a Thing. She received an Emmy nomination for Showtime's What Girls Learn, and she won the Humanitas Award for ABC Family's Searching for David's Heart. She also sold and produced a branded series for The Web with Sony Crackle. Karen co-wrote a series of films with Eleanor Coppola called Love is Love is Love, and she was a writer associate producer on the Apple series Little Voice. Recently, she sold a series called Aqua Tofana to Netflix, for which she is writing the pilot. She's also writing a feature called Twisted Sister for Sony, and she wrote a horror film, Lil Holly O, that she hopes to direct. Beyond film and TV, Karen's also working on a book of short stories that cover subjects very meaningful to her, like the 99 Cent Store, her dog, the miserable state of politics, evil people that get away with evil things, the theater of sex, and more. So for all of those reasons, it's my great honor and pleasure to be joined on StoryBeat today by the multi-talented Karen Lee Hopkins. Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. So let's go back in time a little bit. You, I said in the intro that you sort of came out to LA as an actor trying to find your way into movies, but you didn't get very far. But what started you into wanting to be in the business in the first place? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I always loved acting. I was doing theater or creating it. I was the only, I created the drama club at my high school. And and then I was the only person in the drama club, right? And then we actually, uh, we actually cast a show, but by the time we were going to do it, everyone had dropped out but me. It was, uh, as my mother would say, very determined um, to to be seen and um, and heard, and that was also important because they came from an Italian Hungarian family. So to be seen and heard, you got to kind of yell over it all. But uh, I'm a twin as well, and I feel like my twin kind of uh, we're very close, but very very different in many ways. And she satisfied that in the family. She was going to be a doctor in psychology and and was going to go off and do that. And I was right. just like I lived in my what is it the the E. e. Cummings thing? There's an artist and the scientist, and the artist lives inside themselves. And I was always you know, imagining life outside of Sandusky, Ohio, not that it was a bad place to grow up in at all, because it wasn't, but uh, it informed a lot. And so I wanted to to act and t- too long a story uh, to go into, but I basically got a car, my license after failing the test like three or four times and drove out here. Um, How old were you? 20. And uh, just was like, I, you know, I don't want to go to school. I talked my parents into thinking that 
Um, I got a scholarship at the Strasbourg Institute. They don't even think they give them, but at, at any rate, I, I came out here. I studied at Strasbourg on, when it was on Hollywood Boulevard and, you know, loved it. I loved acting and um, knew no one and just wanted to forge that path. Did you find that very difficult to do to go to LA and not know anyone? Yeah, I mean, it was scary, but it was scarier the alternative, which is not doing what you wanted. My mom wanted to be an artist. And um, at 16, she, she wanted to be a painter. Uh, you know, uh, she drew. And some idiot teacher told her, you don't have an imagination. Oh All goodness. you know how to do is copy well. She put her, her charcoal pencil down and walked out of school at 16. And it it was such a formidable story for me because it was just like, I, I think I grew up carrying that anger at that teacher and also the sadness that my mom, who I think had such creativity in her, did not do that, right? And as an Italian mother, she was always giving me two sides of it. Oh, you know, you're really good, but you don't want to risk something because what are you going to do if you fail? You know, it was always that back and forth, the, the contradiction, which I think I have embraced, unfortunately, in my own life in, in many ways. But, um, uh, but if you don't fail, you don't succeed. Right. And you, and, and you just got to push through it. And that's, that's what I did. And I remember, I think she was shocked that I came out, but it was... It was necessary, right? It was so, something that you felt you had to do. It wasn't something that was like a you had a choice with. You wanted to do it, but you had to do it. Oh yeah, no, I had to do it, and 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 because I had no support. <laughs> I mean, my parents. My dad had a friend of his. He was teaching at a community college. Some witch that used to teach at the school I was at actually called me right before, like the eve of before I was leaving to say, there's a hundred of you, you know? And I said, there's only one of me, you know, you get very dogmatic. And of course I, I knew nothing, right? Like I really had no background other than doing some theater. Well, you were untrained at the time, yes? It's an understatement, yes. But I had done community theater and stuff and, um, and just had a sense like, ah, I can do, I can do this. I want to do this. And so I came out and, and started getting in plays and did some stand up at the comedy store when you could go in on a Sunday and just kind of work up a, a scene um, because I was in a scene study class, you know, that kind of thing. And I would write stuff. And, and, and I thought it was funny and perhaps I was a bit overconfident, but that ended soon. Enough. So your, your training mostly was of the street, as they say. In, in other words, you were you didn't go to a formal school for it. No, I mean, I ultimately, I mean, I started then studying at Strasbourg. Then I went and I really loved working with uh, a wonderful uh, coach, Roy London, and then Peggy Fury, who I adored. Mm -hmm. Did you get any training as a writer as well, or was it mostly performance? Zero. Uh, as a writer, it's what is it, the, the Leonard Cohen quote that I always quote, writing is a desperate activity. And it was really that I had gotten cut out of my third movie. I would call home because like, you're in it and then you're, you're conveniently cut out before the movie comes out, right? My twin was getting her, her master's in psychology. And there was always this long pause, right? When I'd say, well, I was in it. And then there was the long excuse as to why I was not in it anymore. <laughs> and my mom was like, honey, you're a failure, come home. And it was like, and that was in a loving way in her mind. And I just thought- She was you know, trying to protect you. Totally, she really was. And I decided, you know, I was selling like ideas. At the time you could sell an idea to the, a person who knew someone else. And I sold like a couple of movie ideas to people and then just decided I'm going to write. Uh, and, and one person in particular was really- uh, established screenwriter at the time was like really a hot writer in Hollywood. And I thought, you know, I'm going to, I got the story in my head. I'm going to write it down. And I wrote it in uh, 10 days. And at the time I, 
I had finally landed with an agency that, you know, was a, was a substantial uh, acting agency. And I told them in a meeting, well, I also, you know, I write, I just wrote a screenplay and they kind of rolled their eyes, but they had a lit department. (laughs) <laughs> and they gave it to the lit department. And I was living on an alley apartment. And I remember they read it and they said, we gave it to, a, it was the head of the studio at the time. And, you know, they've offered this amount of money against this amount of money. I mean, like they had <laughs> no money, right? And they said, we turned it down because we think there's a lot of play there. And I just remember I had just come back from like the the Beverly Hills library or something, trying to put together another, because, you know, like if you're not acting, you are, or waiting for a phone call to go for an audition, you, I just was enjoying the process of writing and creating and not, not asking permission, which is such a a gift as a writer, right? Like you don't have to Like I can act by myself, which I did my, and drove my family insane and others that know me as well, you know, in the house all the time. But like, there is something to be said for going to an audition, actually nailing the role and then getting to be on the set, which was fantastic. And that did happen a number of times, miraculously. So they said there's play there. And this was more money, quite honestly, Steve, than I'd ever heard of. My mom was a factory worker. my dad, uh, had he been in a different business and in a different town, I think would have been super uber successful, but we're really super, super working class people. And, and I'm like, you know, you think you're kidding. They're kidding. And, and so I just remember they started bidding, right. It was when bidding wars were still You got into an actual bidding war and you had no idea what you were doing. I, none whatsoever. And that became evident, I think, when they reread the script. But at the time they read it, it was called The Kindness of Strangers, ironically. Uh, there was another <laughs> film, I think, that ultimately got made called that. But in any way, it changed my life. It changed my family's life. They finally ended at a number the next morning where I called my mom on the factory line. And we were never allowed to do that. We never did that. But I called her um, and they and I got her on the phone and I said, mom, you can quit your job now. I'm going to buy you the house that you always wanted. There was this cul-de-sac house that she loved. And she said, that just does not happen to people like us. And then <laughs> she, it was, I mean, this really dates it, but Joe Biden, I think maybe seven years prior had had there was that whole thing and I, I like Joe Biden but he there was a plagiarism thing that he did right. and she said you didn't copy it you didn't copy that script from something else I said no mom I actually wrote it myself and 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 they're buying it and I'm going to buy you this house so I need to ask you you obviously you didn't go to school for this how did you know how to format a script how did you know how to even make a script look like a script I went to the library and got a copy of um William Goldman's uh Adventures in the Screen Trade No the western he did Oh Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Thank Kid. you I read Butch Cassidy it was the first script I ever read and I was so enthralled by his writing and also his prose And I had been like a a huge, I love poetry and I would write, I mean, E.E. Cummings was a huge influence for, I'd rather read E.E. Cummings than, I mean, I'm not educated enough to to even say comparatively than something else, but I would read him and I loved the way he played with words and all of that. And so, but between that and uh, E.E. Cummings and, um, and William Goldman, I just, I, I never read anything else. And I just wrote this script. Wow. And I really think the prose of my script sold it more than the actual structure. Because if you really looked at it now, I mean, it was a very super quirky comedy. And it didn't get made, but they bought two other films of mine, same company, like almost in succession. Wow. And it was really, and they were specs. Then- the, uh, separately, I w- wrote Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael on the film I wasn't cut out of, Running Man. I was acting in it, but it was like six weeks. And I thought, what am I going to do? I'm in this trailer. I got to do. 
And I, so I wrote Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael, and that is the first film that got produced. So that, that's, uh, that's an amazing story because it's pretty rare. That doesn't happen frequently. Well, you know, to me, it was like, and it's what I talk about with writers and I talk about with friends who, you know, you, you get an idea in your head and you like, like do it right. Writers have to write. And it wasn't like I thought, I mean, I, I honestly didn't think beyond this is a cool notion. I really, I, I think you have to write what you know. And I was always working something out. And whether it's a comedy or a horror, <laughs> whether it's a serial killer or uh, like a, a, a drama, I am always identifying somewhere within there, deeply within a character. And um, all of those characters, uh, especially in the early stuff that I would write, only is, and now, but um, were pieces of my life. You early on figured out that you were going to write about things that you understood and knew, and that you were going to write using yourself within the material. Yeah, I mean, I thought if I don't care about it, nobody else is going to. And believe me, I took some other jobs that were pitched to me because then you start going, oh, okay, cool, great. Yeah, I mean, you're going to pay me to write that story that... I learned very quickly. I had no relationship to, and they learned very quickly. It's not very good. So, I mean, there's been a lot of learning curve in it. Uh, yeah. But I think anymore, I ask what, like, even on something I'm producing that I'm like, why does it matter? How will it sustain? How will we sustain with it for a long period of time? It's really critical, right? And because uh, we know that with notes, just with time, with anything, it has to have a potency and for you to keep making it new and to keep surprising yourself, which is the, the whole idea, whether it's a series or a movie or whatever. But I think well, that can happen. That's a huge key is that an audience needs to not know what's coming next, even though you, the writer, must. Uh, that key of that. Agree. Yeah. I mean, we have to know what the world is and everything. And I think, but I, I try to stay loose, even in this. Uh, I mean, I, I love a story, right? I know, okay, no, it has to be this and it has to be that. But I like to give myself a lot of play because I feel like if I do, I'll surprise you better. What do you start with? Do you start with character? Do you start with plot or just the kernel of an idea? Where do you begin? You Depends. Just really depends. I write on the backs of receipts, of post its. Uh, you you know, something that tickles me, the smallest idea in the world. And I've had relationships roll their eyes and go, oh, for God's sakes, are we now a, one of your movie ideas? It's like, well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Taylor Swift writes every song about every relationship she's, relationship she's ever had. Well, yeah. I mean, like that just makes perfect sense to me, you know, or like the horror films of whether it's uh, the what if of, of being a mother and, and loving your child so much that it's terrifying and God knows there's material for that all over. You're, you're um, saying that your life is grist for the mill. Yep. And so when you then sit down to actually construct something, it still requires a structure. A screenplay is a certain length. It's not like a novel where you can write it for a thousand pages. There is a, a standard more or less length to a screenplay unless you're writing a number of movies back to back, um, they're going to be somewhere between 95 and 120 pages, basically. So you then need to actually structure it because most good movie storytelling is architectural in some way. It's not, sure. it, it winds up not being free form at the end of the day, even though you may start out that way. So do you then, how do you do it? Do you then sit down and say to yourself, I'm going to organize this in some way before I begin to write the actual script? Yes. Like right now I'm writing two concurrently, but I'll focus on one mostly. And then I'll make notes on another, but I will, once I know where I'm going with the story, like after the notion, after the inspiration, if it keeps staying with me, I take extended notes. Then I look at those notes and I try to go, okay, is act one, okay, what is the turning point? Where is act two surprise? Why are we still interested? Is it sustaining? Because if it's not sustaining me, even in a notes, uh, as I write 
I like to write longhand, you know, so that it's not so perfectly written that it's done. I, lo I love that process. I love get my, my daughter will go, mom, there are so many pieces of paper. I'm like, Don't touch that. <laughs> that's, that's that one thing that I, and um, then I will put it together and I'll go act one, two, three, and the turning points, but try to keep it loose and then see where I surprise myself. Sometimes I'll just write bullet points out because I can get real lengthy otherwise. And then with that scaffolding, I'll start, you know, I'll start with if sometimes if I know scenes, if I'm writing a pilot, it's different because a, like for, for instance, this thing I just did for Netflix, it was as much as I dislike outlines, the outline really helped me because it was a scaffolding. It was a way of not just looking at the pilot, but the series as a whole. And also like, it's been extraordinarily wonderful writing the pilot because it made it actually more fun, you know? Cause okay, I, I've got this, this is the goal. This is where this breaks, but I get to do this now. And this can surprise everyone. And that is just been delicious. Plus I've loved going deep into that world but having a structure where I know I'm going to end up, even though I just worked, just played, I was working with my incredibly creative, creative assistant, Julian. And uh, I just said, you know, I'm going to do this for the end, just, just because um, I'm going to give them a little bit more and we can pull back on that because mm -hmm. I knew what it was, how, how it was going to end. But I thought if I do this, these three other things, maybe I don't need them but maybe it will inspire. I think choices are really good. And they're all within hopefully keeping the theme so that we're not going all over the place. We just keep, keep it honed. Would you say that most of your work is character driven or plot driven? Character driven. Character driven. So what do you then do? Do you have a technique or a trick or something that you do to develop characters that you know are are going to be compelling and interesting to watch or just a, t a technique, you know, is there something you do? Is there something, is there some form that you use or is there some kind of process you go through in which you develop characters or does it just change every time? I, I would say that the character I'm doing in for Netflix is, is based in history. Um, is it based on real, real, real people? She was a real character. Everything mm. around her is fiction. Got it. And, but that's been so much fun. So going and doing the research that's extremely limited for 1650s Italy, but going, okay, well, I, I'm going to do this, can take you on such a ride. And that ride has led me to other rides. Like, okay, just research. Uh, like on a different script, I'm doing somebody that works in a potato chip factory. Like research potato chip factories, research that world and see who works there, why she works there, what it smells like when you leave the factory, what you really want, what you don't want. The wants, um, the acting background has helped so much because you know, you always ask, I think as a character, when you're uh, creating one, what does that character want? What is driving that character? And so the same is true as writing a character. Do you play What's the characters as you're writing? Sometimes, sometimes obnoxiously. Sometimes I try not to. <laughs> I try not to get too precious with that. I actually have uh, my, my assistant reads out loud this stuff. I try not to do it because I hear, I, I take my phone sometimes on a walk with my dog and I'll talk into the phone <laughs> as the character. And my daughter heard me playing it back one morning and was like, mom, what in God's, what is the matter? You sound insane. And I thought, okay, character's a little too victim-y right now. Character's a little too intense. But yeah, I mean, I think finding character and then who that character, uh, what that character's secret is, the character's desire, uh, what they wanted, what they settled for, what they didn't settle for, what's really uh, burning in them. That's also fascinating to me. That's part of the key, isn't it? What, is it? what does your protagonist, your hero, what does he or she want? So that you, that sort of drives the whole train, right? Right. And what, act, what, what what's the term these days? What activates them? As but, a, is that the yeah. current terminology is activate? Yes. What, what's the activating thing? And, um, and it can be a number of 
of different things, but I'm trying, I try to really stay as disciplined as possible, like in ways that I, I was thinking about it, you know, how to work better by really sticking with it, by going, okay, I've got all of these ideas, but just really try to concentrate on, on a first draft of just making the story sizzle and really work and then put in your other ideas if they're good ideas for telling this, if they tell the story better. Otherwise, less is more, which is a new one for me because so much for, for so long, it was more is more. And yet when I'm reading with other people's work, I'll go, you don't need that. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to edit that out because you've got it already. I, I'll overstate something 17 times. It's like, well, Karen, we get it for God's sake. The, the Let me just say it to you one more way. You know, the, the beauty part about what you're talking about is it's always better to overwrite because you can pull back, but it's yeah. much more challenging to underwrite and try to pad out. I think that, that that you're doing it the right way. So I'm curious, you alluded to, you have, an, you know, what your story is going to be, what your script is going to sort of structure. Do you then just write random scenes in any order or do you start at the beginning and plow your way through? It depends. I have, I, I often start in the beginning and try to plow my way through. And if I don't get inspiration, instead of pushing it, I will put a placeholder on that scene, knowing what has to happen or needs to happen in order to, I don't know, get to the, a couple scenes later. But if I have inspiration for other scenes, I will work on those because sometimes those will come to you easier. And then sometimes it becomes gobbledygook. And I will go, I have wasted two weeks on absolutely nothing, but this little gem has come out of it. Mm -hmm. And that is going to take me now back into the script and into a direction that that makes more sense. You know, the, the process is, is different really every, every time, but I try to concentrate on getting it down, then staying in that world, staying very quietly in that world. I'll putter. I get up at five in the morning is my general time, uh, five, five 30. And then uh, get a lot of very inspired, not, I don't, I'm not saying I'm inspired, but the most inspiration I get is early. I'll get that down. Or if I'm working on something that I'm having a problem with, I attack it in the morning. Then I take a break, work out, whatever I have to do, work, walk the dog, you know, complain to the neighborhood about something, <laughs> then come back in <laughs> and try to break it up so that it isn't monotonous in any way. Cause I do really love the isolation of writing by myself. And then I also love writing with partners. It just depends. And then either stay with that script or, you know, like sometimes you have to rewrite other films that are at various phases, but always going, okay, what is the baby that has to be focused on the most right now and give that the strongest energy. And then, from there we go, you know, I mean, I'm trying to keep all your, your obligations in order. And that includes things I'm producing or interested in doing ideas that were working. Cause a lot of times, you know, you're, you're like, like I never go, okay, that's it. I've got it. They're going to make this and off we go. I mean, who the heck knows? And, and it's also fun to go, okay, what about this story? And so I'll be working on that with various writers or producers or, you know, it takes a really long time to find that, but that's so much fun. How many drafts do you typically do before you're prepared to give it to someone else who's going to really judge it, judge it for money, green lighting, and so on? How many drafts do you typically do? How much polishing do you do before you're ready to turn it in? The number 17 goes into my head. I'll think <laughs> of after about 10, I'll show it to someone. And then I'll just drive myself insane, mm -hmm. depending on whether, whatever, you know, it's the four out of five dentist survey, you know, it, it's like, they like it good, but I don't anymore. Like that's my growth, hopefully as a person and as a, as a writer, I don't know. I don't, I guess they're intertwined. I want to believe it's good, but I also ha have to know it for myself. And so I just have to go, okay, just sit with it. Don't be impulsive. I mean, it's something I've learned because I have been impulsive in my life in the past. Don't hand it in too early. Don't even hand it in too fast. Even if they're saying, where in the heck is it? Because 
as much as I like to keep my deadlines, I also know if this area is still bugging me and I'm still talking to myself about it, just don't hand it in until it's ready. But I'd say 17 drafts. I mean, I really write a lot. And that means you are also not just, you're not starting over it as most people don't, but you're, you're rewriting various things. You're trying to make things sing better and feel better and more, make the script tighter and so on. So you must be a very fine polisher as well. You like to polish till you get it just so, to you make that sculpture really sculpted right. I do. I think it's really important. I think that it's irresponsible at this point in my career. Uh, I think it's such a gift. I'm so grateful, honestly, Steve, to be doing the work that I'm, I'm well, I've sure. a lot to do. And I really love it. And I just feel like, don't screw this up, Hopkins. You can take your time with it to the exclusion. I mean, I, I do know that I have friends and, and just social things. I, I'm not even, I don't care to do. I mean, I'm really, really, really happy to be in the work. I don't feel like, oh, I have to go now. I have to stop. I don't like when people go, what are you doing for vacation? It's like, well, I, I'm going to finish this draft and then I'm going to go to the other. I don't, I mean, I, I love having a social life if it occurs, but the whole pandemic of the was really an opportunity to write things that, I mean, this, this speck of horror that I, that I am passionate about came out of that time. You know, it didn't come out of the pandemic, the worry of the pandemic. It just came out of a different part of me that I allowed, I had the time to do it. You know, how, how has your writing changed as you have gotten more into directing? Has it changed the way that you approach scripts? A hundred percent. In what way? Because I think that you go, okay, that film, that shot, that scene's going to get cut. That is not necessary for the antagonist. It's not even an interesting setup so much. That's just you kind of thinking that it's, th that's a cool scene or that's a cool idea. But ultimately um, it's like, how is this going to cut? How is this going to um, make us care to go to the next scene? Is this good? I, I don't mind if a character is unlikable or anything, but how are you going to form this world that's going to be so compelling for an audience, you know? Funny that you say, because I, I'm not going to be directing this pilot. I wouldn't get that opportunity, but I love it so much. So I really see it and want to see the world. And I think it's my responsibility as the writer. If, if you're a writer that sees things like that, some writers write so beautifully and economically, and it's a palette for the director to come in and they can put something else on it. But for me, and, and that, that will happen hopefully on this no matter what, but for me, I love the detail. I love that blue cobalt bottle. My assistant laughs so much and it, it's become a filigree blue cobalt bottle <laughs> and it's now a cobalt blue bottle hit by the light and the prism of light you know i i can just go on and so that sometimes i'll just go okay enough already the you know the same thing is true of um overwriting for a character allow the character to the, your lines and what their journey is to to uh, tell the story, don't have to give character descriptions. I mean, I used to write, she smiles. Well, why would I write, she smiles? I mean, unless she, that's such an odd character thing for her to do or him to do. I like to tell students that you don't tell the actors how to act on paper yeah. unless there's something that's plot significant. Right, exactly. Better put than, than me. Well, yeah. but yes, better, exactly. But, uh, it, so, all right, so when you, um, got your first directing gig. How did that change the way that you looked at writing? Was it I challenging think, to direct your own words? No, I really liked, I loved directing and I love directing. And what's challenging is being allowed to direct your own words. You know what I mean? I Sometimes, do know. Uh, yeah. So it's like the whole thing of like, um, I, I see it this way. And I've learned that if writing is a collaborative ultimately becomes collaborative. Directing is extremely collaborative and you'd better have a crew and a team that also supports that. So, you know, I, I think I think I'll go with less is more right now, but I learned that you got to get the choices you want that are so key. Where did you learn how to direct? Just by being around sets? By being around sets, not enough sets, and I'm still learning. I think you watch good movies, you watch good 
shows you, I think I've always been really interested. I recall even in my first script that people would say you write very visually. Uh, your world is extremely visual. And that just comes very natural to me. I see it. Now, I don't <laughs> want to go, I see it and nobody else sees it either. Um, because there's interpretations and sometimes you nail it and sometimes you don't. For like Miss Meadows, I saw it so vividly. And then, of course, you go, okay, I saw it very vividly in this uh, town, but now we have to shoot it in this town. And it doesn't look the same even in my head. How are we going to do that? You're saying production forced you into a different environment than you first. Yeah, started. light production, money, whatever. And that's the way it goes. And so for me, I've really thought about a lot of that because, you know, ultimately it's up to you. It's on you. Don't blame anybody else if it doesn't work and learn that uh, this this could have been done better this this was a moment you didn't quite get damn it but you still see it and you'll get it the next time you well know? isn't directing really the art of how do you make the best use of compromise well that's a great way to put it i've never really heard it that way i suppose that it is yeah that's a you're, really great way you're constantly compromising whether your loss of finances or the sunlight has gone out or uh, the actors are not giving you the lines delivered the way you want them and whatever it is, you're constantly compromising. And then it's a question of how do you put that big stew together to make something that everybody goes, wow, look at that. That's such a, I love that. I remember when we were shooting the first scene of Miss Meadows, um, we were in Cleveland. Okay. Now I wanted a bluebird. I wanted certain things that um, as she's on her walk, that we just weren't going to get. We're lucky we had a truck and an actor and, and Katie and the whole thing and all that is fine. And suddenly, I mean, this is late summer or not late summer, well, July in, in Ohio. Katie is walking in her white gloves as Miss Meadows and it's a beautiful day and she's tap dancing and three deer come bounding out this is like a suburban neighborhood deer are my totem animal my favorite animal deer are her you know to me the character she lives in fear but she pushes through it three deer came out of nowhere steve mm -hmm. a mother and two babies and bounding past her and kate i mean, we were the we had a steady camp katie turned and just looked at the deer and we followed her stare as and got them all in the shot. It was crazy. We're talking about Katie Holmes, yes? Katie Holmes, yeah. But talk about that was that was compromising in Cleveland, but getting deer in Cleveland, it was a serendipity, you know. Well, sometimes magic just happens. Yeah. So, but yeah, and uh, sometimes it doesn't. And then when it doesn't, you just, uh, you got to try to make it happen. How important do you think it, it is for you as a director that you have acting as a background? Well, for me, I, it's extremely helpful. Uh, I mean, it's imperative. How, I see, how, do, how does it help you? In what way? I think that, uh, I think I can know how to talk to an actor, hopefully, and not talk to an actor <laughs> and shut up around an actor and let an actor <laughs> talk to the actor themselves. And find it, um, that goes for every character, everybody on the set. I remember somebody said extras and I'm like, that person's not an extra. That is a character with a name. You know, I'm I, like, you. I really believe that. Um, I, I, I love actors and I loved, I, I miss acting. And I think that you also trust then that they're taking the character and they're going to do some magic with it that you had no idea. And even if it wasn't what you imagined, I also believe, like, let them do those takes. Let them have that freedom. Because Katie would come up, Katie Holmes would come up with ideas. And she's an extraordinary tap dancer and sequences that were fantastic. And it's really giving them the time, uh, which sometimes we didn't have, which I wish... My biggest regret is we shot that film in 
like 16 and a half days and it needed more time. You need more time sometimes. I, I think that's the common yeah. complaint that most directors have. No matter how much time they have, they sure. just don't have enough. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think one of the things in my experience has been that when you get a really good actors saying your words, they take it to a place that you never even imagined when you were writing it and you imagined it as good as you thought you could imagine it and yet they make it even better. 100%. It's so it, exciting. Yeah. Would, would you, if somebody asked you, would you go back to acting now? Hell yeah. Somebody just asked me that recently. They said, you haven't ruined your face uh, with a lot of, well, you know, it's like, well, I can't afford it, but no, I wouldn't. But that, uh, yeah, I, I would love it. I mean, I think it's fun, but like, I'll take the gig that I'm getting right now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm grateful for that. But yeah, I actually, over the pandemic shot, a short of my daughter actually shot it, but of me, I was on the phone a lot. So I said, let's, uh, let's do this. And I, I did this thing called on hold that we're just editing now, which was, it's, it's not really funny. It's more docudrama, but um, yeah, I like acting. I wasn't acting on the phone when I was talking to Best Buy, but you know. Here, here's a question that I ask lots of guests. So what for you yeah. makes a good story good? I love an element of surprise and um, rooted in something that's really relatable. Stories of loss are really compelling to me. They can be funny stories of loss. Irony makes me, I love irony. And I love um, stories of people, they don't play by the rules. So anybody that doesn't play by the rules to me, I'm, I'm in. I'm in, break the rules, uh, break the rules within the story. Um, somebody who doesn't accept the status quo is a very interesting character to me. I like left of center people. So you like Mavericks? Please, yes, I do, <laughs> I do. Directing, writing, being in show business in general comes with a certain level of built-in pressure. Directing is probably more pressure packed on a day-for-day -day basis on a set than most other jobs in the business. What do you do to handle pressure? I do a lot of yoga in the morning before I get to the set. Mm -hmm. I remind myself constantly that I do have a sense of humor and you'd better use it at all times. That's good. And for me, it's really important to have a very calm set. Even if I'm not calm inside, it has that feeling and vibe. How do you keep your, is, are you acting when you're doing that? When you are roiling inside, sure. but outside your calm as can be? Sure. You're acting your way through oh, that. Oh God, yes, yes, yes. Fake it, fake it, baby. Fake it. But like, also it's fun, you know? I mean, that's the other thing. I, I think that it's fun and just, I feel like every day when I wake up, like, you know, I, okay, I got a list of things I got to do or a list of shots we've got to make if it's, if it's a film or whatever. But um, also give yourself a little bit of leeway that this, like even if it's something you're dreading, change the way you think about it. Give me an example of something that you were dreading. How did you handle that? There was a instance on the set where an actor who came in for a day had to do a really violent scene. And he decided that... He was the victim. And it was definitely not a victim character. Okay. okay. But he decided he was the victim. And so he wanted to play it very differently than I'd written it and very differently than we talked about it. And there, I gave him the, some time to talk about it, like, right? But we got to the set and everything's, you know, you have two minutes to shoot this because we have to go get this before the set is coming down. And um, he really pushed up against it. And now, you know, the camera's set up and everybody's in there and we're rehearsing it and he's playing it a different way. And I, I said, I'll give you one. You can do it your way. I said, but then you'll be doing it my way. And I got why. And it's, I, I really had to say, because I'm the director, I wrote it and that's how you're going to do it. And he did it beautifully. I think his anger at me <laughs> for really kind of just saying, uh-uh, I don't care. <laughs> you know, you go write your own movie where you're the victim and killing people. 
uh, but you're going to, you're going to die in this particular piece. And this is how you're going to play it. Right. Um, because he didn't even want to die. You know, he didn't really quite understand why he had to get shot. An excellent argument, but not an argument that was going to hold for me. Well, yeah, go write your own for heaven's sake. Yeah. And, and I won't be surprised if he, if he didn't, you know. All right. So how do you handle, I know you've gotten them because we've all gotten them, notes from people. When you go into a meeting and you are given a set of notes that somehow are either confusing, conflicting, you totally disagree with, whatever it would be about notes, what is your method for handling notes? For notes, I have notes. I've got notes all around that say, listen, shh less is more <laughs> stay composed they're all over right so i usually try not to react i listen carefully try to stay really honest in how i'm uh, absorbing it but but i usually like to take my time with it and then come back rather than overreact initially because it's always led me down a very bad path if I a overreact and b don't like I, I'll I'll take the note I'll think about it and I'll realize even if I dislike this note so much there's something not working for this person in this and even if they give me ideas which I love it, the Hollywood idea this is wrong but and they'll give they'll say it but they actually are saying often. I want you to do it exactly this way. And I'll keep saying it. And I'll tell you it again, which I get a lot. I, 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 I like to take them in, really think about them, honor them. Sometimes even, Steve, is, even if I hate the note, I try to do it or I will do it. I will apply it. I will try my very best because they're so adamant that they're right. And rather than create an argument, because I know what I think is right, what, what I think holds, and I'll do it because I think that that process is more honorable rather than fighting it. I don't bend over. I don't go, oh, okay, sure. I won't do that. I'm in a, on a project right now where I haven't liked a lot of the notes, but a lot of those bad notes, even that I thought were bad notes or notes that did not jive at all with what I thought the truth of the character or the story was, they did lead me somewhere if I didn't resist it too much. So I just try to go, okay, Hopkins, you're not a baby. E eventually you will find a way to, to make it work, even if it's not working for them right now. Because I also believe like if they're going, mm, or if somebody goes, yeah, I liked it. Or if there's a lukewarm response, that is death to me. I'd rather them hate it or be effusive, but something like, there's a lot of good in there. I think, boy, you did not give them what they wanted. So you need to hear what it is they're really looking for or what it is that's so undeniable. That's the new word too, isn't it? Undeniable or something so irresistibly, deliciously good. Make it so good that even with their bad notes incorporated somehow, somewhere, like that one nugget of something, I think you can keep working. You're saying that even bad notes can potentially trigger good thoughts. Oh, yeah. I just think the more you resist them and the more you go, ah, oh, you know, I'm not going to pay any attention to them. It's not a good idea. For me, I like to take the note and go, there's something in there that that person, now, granted, not everybody's a genius, and sometimes you do have to be dismissive and go, they're trying to tell their own story and they're trying to work their own program and they need to do that in a different project. I mean, I, I'm not afraid to say that and I'm not afraid to fight the note, but I first will work the note because I think that is more, I, I think that's my responsibility as a writer. It's part of the collaborative yeah. process as well. Yeah, and go, I tried it and here, sometimes I'll even write the scene out and go, here is the scene, here is the note incorporated. I'm going to say it doesn't work to me. And here's why. And this is what I did, though, with that note affecting me, because I do feel like, you know, you don't want people to not be able to say something to you. I know a lot of writers I've even worked with, they can't take a note. Well, they, they will take not it, take, they a take note. it personally. And it rarely is personal. Somebody exactly. else, somebody like, else on the other side of the table has an opinion. They yep. had a reaction. So I've often told students, take the note let the reaction sink in because somebody bumped up against something that didn't work for them and take the note and see if maybe there's something that you could improve on. 
And if not, then go back and, and make it the best that you can with what you have. But I think your philosophy toward it is outstanding. That's just exactly the right way to do it is to take the note and, and see what you can do. So do you have a philosophy toward pitching that helps you to sell? Is there something that you do in pitches that you think is useful? I am, okay, with an acting background, you'd think I could pitch the hell out of something. I understand. I'm the worst. No <laughs> word. I you, have to have a script. You and I me both. To, you and me both. I have to have a script. So, and then even with the script, then I have to act the script out. Then I have to rehearse it over and over again. I just get it so good and so rehearsed that you can then be loose with it. But it takes a while. But I, for me, pitching... I dislike it so much that I've just taken it on as like, okay, this is a handicap of yours. Now go in and make it as good as possible. You can do this. And to, you know, I, I pitched over the pandemic on zoom and sold three things in a way that like, that was crazy to me. And one project, and this is like for any writer, this is a movie. I, I kid you. I have wanted to do for, since I started writing, I've had this idea for almost 30 years. I have pitched the idea. I have almost sold the idea. I have set it up. I've had other writers come in because I wasn't allowed to pitch it. Da, 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 da. They put a um, showrunner on. We pitched it to the networks. I wasn't allowed to say anything. It tanked. I sold it on a one line pitch over the pandemic. One line. That's it. They didn't <laughs> ask for anything else. And I, it was just like, really? And I lived with it. So, but like most of the time, I just try to be as prepared as possible and know I love the project, right? Because like there's stuff that some people, they didn't get the pitch or whatever, but I'm still working that pitch. So it took you 30 years to figure out how to refine it down to one line. One line. That's pretty awesome. I'm just curious in all of your experiences, I'm sure you have more than one. Can you relate to us a story that you or an experience you went through that was either quirky, weird, offbeat, strange, or maybe just plain funny? Well, I would say that there's so many, but I would say that the, <laughs> the, the weirdest, the thing I was just talking to you about, about this idea that I just would not take no for an answer, um, which is kind of my own philosophy is write what you know and don't take no <laughs> because they don't really know. And you do. And so you just have to keep working it. But this experience, this was a, an idea that I've had. Um, I actually just, I pitched it to my manager, who is one of the most extraordinary, congenial, like supportive, incredible people, really changed my life creatively um, with opportunity. Um, I haven't been with her that long. You know, I've told her a bunch of ideas. Well, I told her this idea, zero. I got nothing. She hated it. I could tell, you know, it was just like, mm -hmm, next, what else do you have in your bag of tricks? But I just thought, you know, I think it's a really good idea. And she set up a general meeting and I pitched this idea that I had and the person heard it in one line. I pitched a number of my other ideas. Okay, goodbye, lovely pitch. Okay, it was nice meeting her, follow up. Thank you so much. Da, 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 da. Any of those ideas stuck. Six months later, my manager in the morning, right? I'm up early. I get a very early email from her saying, so-and-so wants that idea. It's like, what idea? It was the idea I pitched six months prior. One, the, the idea I've had carrying around with me, schlepping it, pitching it to anyone in the neighborhood who'll listen to me for 30 years. Wow. And I'm writing it right now to the delight of being able to have also the freedom to write it I, like first of all she doesn't know how much I've wanted to do it and how long I've been working on it and also you have to make it new but that opportunity blows my mind and I say it to so many writers like don't give up man do if you think that I if you believe in that idea that idea can be done and it has been done four other times in five other big movies but I'm doing it this way and so it will have its own hopeful uniqueness and it will be of the time that we're in right now and probably be more potent than when I thought of it 30 years ago. So it's time has come. 
I hope so. Unless, you know, 10 years from now, I'm saying, you know, still working that out, but now <laughs> it's more relevant. So our last question for you today, Karen, you've given us an enormous amount of really useful, helpful, terrific advice. I'm wondering if you have one solid piece of advice or a tip that you've thought about that would be helpful for those who are tr either trying to break into the business, or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to that next level. I just think write what you know and write every day, write something, write on a, on anything, but write. You don't have to sit there for four hours. You don't have to carve out lots of time for yourself, but write, just keep like you would taking a walk, like you would, whatever your routine is every day, if you really have something to say, say it. Don't say, oh, I, I talked to so many people who almost got that screenplay done or almost wrote it down, but were afraid for some reason. They heard too many other voices. I don't compare yourself with no one but yourself. Write about what you care about and someone else I really believe will care about it. <laughs> I think that is really... Um really effective and solid advice for people that you, if you don't believe in it, why would anyone else? You have to stay with it for a long time. So it better be something that you really and truly have that matters to you. Well, Karen Lee Hopkins, this has been a fantastic hour on Storybeat. And I'm so grateful that you've spent a little time with me today. And I think that people will be inspired by your story. Well, thanks. It's really nice to talk with you and your you asked the right question and obviously I got a lot to say so thanks for your time and I hope I do inspire someone they sh writing is is very therapeutic and so we've come to the end of today's story beat if you like this episode won't you please take a moment to give us a comment rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to your support helps us bring more great story beat episodes to you Storybeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.